done for these uh, as speakers uh, for this event. Uh, I just had a couple of quick um, announcements and then I will hand off to Anton Zilman who will be introducing uh, Professor Goldenfeld uh, today. Uh, so, so this is the schedule for the talks. Uh, so we have the colloquium today. So it's spread over three days this time. So we have the colloquium by Professor Goldenfeld uh, now, just, just uh, now. Uh, we'll have the public lectures tomorrow. Both the public talks will be tomorrow. The, the public lecture by uh, Professor Goldenfeld will be, again, will be uh, over Zoom, but it will be uh, streamed uh, to Koffler uh, as it is being done today. Uh, tomorrow, Professor Dan is going to be here in person. Uh, and so those lectures on uh, the second lecture on uh, Thursday, tomorrow, and on Friday will be uh, in person. And there's a number of you who have signed up for meetings, so, so that's great. Uh, the other thing, I had to make a quick announcement about logistics. Um, uh, so, so, of course, the, the schedule for the thing is put up on the poster. Uh, but with respect to snacks and coffee, because it, it, initially the plan was to do this uh, live and we thought we would do it in Koffler, have, the, have like a small snack and coffee in Koffler, but it turns out that that doesn't work out because of space constraints. Uh, so today, for today, the snacks and coffee will be in the physics lounge. So this will be in the McLennan uh, building near the undergraduate labs in the in that wing of the building. Uh, so so you know, welcome everyone, and uh, we look forward to a wonderful uh, series of talks. And uh, we, we'll you know we'll get a chance to interact with the speakers now over the next couple of days. So thanks. I will hand off to Anton Zilman, who will uh, do the introduction. So I'll stop my screen share and um, Anton uh, will take over. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you. Do I need to do something here? Well, welcome everybody here and everybody who is joining uh, online. So it's really, really a great pleasure to have here uh, Professor Nigel Goldenfeld, who has been, uh, <clears throat> oh, well, Professor Goldenfeld has a, ha, had a very, very long and very illustrious career. I'm going to outline some main points. Uh, uh, Nigel, did his undergraduate degree in physics in uh, Cambridge University, sometimes in the early 80s, and then a PhD in uh, statistical uh, mechanics and polymer physics with uh, Sir Edward, um, Sir, Ed, um, Sir Edwards, um, uh, who was one of the main figures in the statistical mechanics in uh, 20th century. Uh, and then after a postdoc at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, <clears throat> he moved to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where he was, uh, where he was uh, for uh, almost all of his career. Until last year, he moved to University to the Department of Physics in the University of San Diego as uh, a Chancellor Distinguished uh, Professor of Physics. Um, Professor Goldenfeld uh, has been in, in a, speaking uh, uh, from the broad perspective, interested in collective effects um, in complex systems from turbulence to evolution. Uh, in particular, while it, in, in uh, Urbana-Champaign, he was a director of the um, section on universal biology in the NASA astrobiology. Institute, just to give you some uh, idea of the breadth of uh, Professor uh, Goldenfeld's interests. And um, <clears throat> he has a very long list of awards and accolades, which is too long to, to go through, but I'll just mention some. He is a fellow of American Physical Society, a uh, fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a member of uh, the National Academy of Sciences. And today and tomorrow, he's going to talk about the really two of the, uh, some of the representative uh, areas he's been uh, working in. Today, it's uh, physics of turbulence 
and tomorrow is the uh, physics of evolution. And just for me personally, or for so many of my colleagues, I can say that uh, Nigel has been a big inspiration for, uh, for, uh, uh, for many of us. And recently, in, on top of all the subjects he has been working on during his career, he also um, um, awaited into, model, into epidemiological modeling of COVID-19 together with two other physicist colleagues and their work made quite a lot of uh, waves. And I, uh, I encourage everybody to look it up on the internet. So without further ado, I uh, give the stage to Nigel. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, be here, at least uh, virtually, uh, to uh, present these, uh, these lectures. Um, so, uh, so first, just to check, everybody can hear me fine, see me fine, and everything's working okay, right? Good, okay, thank you. All right, so without more ado, let me uh, get started. So, all right. So everybody knows that uh, turbulence is the last great unsolved problem of classical physics. But how would we know if we'd actually solve the problem? And, and what would it take to uh, you know, make a, a substantial uh, inroad into this problem? So what I'm going to explain today is, uh, is a perspective on turbulence that comes not so much from fluid mechanics, uh, but from statistical mechanics. And I'm going to show you that we can make uh, a lot of progress um, in two areas. Uh, one is how fluids become turbulent, uh, uh, as you increase uh, the, the flow speed. And the other is how one can understand uh, the, the, the drag that turbulence uh, creates, again, using ideas from statistical mechanics. And the point is that these are novel ideas that come about from statistical physics. Um, I don't know any way to achieve these insights uh, just by thinking about differential equations. They make experimental predictions, and we've also made tested those experimental predictions. We've tested those predictions experimentally, uh, and they work. So I think we've made some progress here, and that's what I want to tell you about. So let's begin with some uh, propaganda, and I'm going to just hide the uh, the median controls up here so I can see uh, better uh, my screen. So there we are. Um, okay, so it's customary in, in physics colloquia to mention some quote from uh, Feynman or something like this. So it's probably best to get it over and done with as quickly as possible. Um, and, uh, and there's a very uh, interesting uh, quote that he, he, he provided for us. So in volume two of the Feynman lectures in physics, uh, he writes the following. We've written down the equations of water flow. This is just after he's described uh, and written down the, the Navier-Stokes equations. From experiment, we find a set of concepts and approximations to use to discuss the solution, vortex streets, turbulent wakes, boundary layers. When we have similar equations in a less familiar situation and one for which we cannot yet experiment, we try to solve the equations in a primitive, halting and confused way to try to determine what new qualitative features may come out or what new qualitative forms are a consequence of the equations. And you'll notice that I've highlighted the word qualitative. Richard Feynman won the Nobel Prize for his work on the renormalization of quantum electrodynamics, and it was the epitome of the quantitative physicist, making uh, uh, his techniques enable us to make predictions to nine or ten decimal places, uh, and they can be compared uh, with experiments, and, and it all works perfectly well. But here what he's talking about is qualitative uh, behavior of physical systems. And he goes on and says, the next great era of awakening of human intellect may well produce a method of understanding the qualitative content of equations. Today we cannot. Today we cannot see that the water flow equations contain such things as the barber pole structure of turbulence that one sees between rotating cylinders. That's called Taylor Coet flow. And he goes on and talks about Schrodinger's equation and frogs and music and stuff like that. Um, so we'll leave it. We'll leave it there. But again, the point he's he's made is that. What we want to understand as, as physicists is the qualitative behavior of matter. And that, of course, is the domain of statistical mechanics. And in statistical mechanics, we would call that the phase diagram. So what we're going to do today is try to understand something about the qualitative content 
of the equation of fluid mechanics by understanding its phase diagram, and in most importantly, applying insights that come from the modern theory of, of phase transitions um, and, and uh, universality, scaling laws of turbulence, the normalization group, and so on. So I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, one is how fluids become turbulence, and the other is so-called uh, fluctuation uh, dissipation relations. Now, in this talk, I'm not going to assume that anybody is an expert on fluid mechanics or turbulence. It's going to be at a level where you can follow this without having, a, having detailed knowledge. So let's start off then with uh, particles bouncing around in a box subject to Newton's equations of motion. And it's very straightforward to consider such a system, to do a computer simulation of it. And you see very easily that statistical mechanics uh, arises from this. You get the, you know, the ideal gas equation of state, you get the you know, thermodynamic phenomena and so on and so forth. So now let's suppose that we don't have many particles in the box, but now we have an infinite number of particles in the box, if you like, a, a field. Then the Navier Stokes equations uh, turn into partial differential equations, which look like this. Um, but we've also added here this extra term, which describes the viscosity or dissipation of the fluid. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that now looking at these, this deterministic system, again, its behavior can have statistical uh, solutions. Statistical mechanics can be used to describe it. But in this case, it's not equilibrium statistical mechanics of particles in a box. It might be uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics describing uh, systems in a flow. And indeed, that's what I've illustrated over here. So here are three different physical systems where the fluid is coming in from the left, uh, going through uh, some obstacle and coming out on the right, uh, in some cases as turbulent as, as over here, in this case as laminar, as this is just an aerofoil. And, uh, and we're going to just look at this, this system and try to say something about it. So first of all, here are the equations. I've written them down before. Uh, don't worry about them. We're not going to really use them in this talk. The control parameter here for the phase diagram is a thing called the Reynolds number, which basically tells you how fast the fluid is, or how big the system is, or how viscous it is. So new here is the kinematic viscosity, which is just the molecular viscosity divided by the density. So the idea is that if the fluid is very viscous, then this is very large and the Reynolds number will be low. And low Reynolds number flow is very steady and predictable, say like what happens when you pour honey or treacle or something like that. On the other hand, if the viscosity is very small or the velocity is very large, so that the Reynolds number is very high, as over here, then uh, what you get is a flow uh, that looks fluctuating, unpredictable, and stochastic, like, like an atmospheric flow, for example. And for a pipe, at least, somewhere around Reynolds number of about 2,000, you get a transition to, from a laminar flow to a turbulent flow, as sketched over here with this wind farm, where you can see regions of turbulence behind the uh, the wind farm propellers uh, interspersed by regions of, of, of laminar flow. And we're going to be saying a lot more about that uh, in what follows. So in my title, I talked about the life and death of turbulence. By this, I mean the life of turbulence is what's happening in this Reynolds number regime where you have turbulence and the death of turbulence is what happens is when you go down in Reynolds number and eventually transition into a laminar, steady, predictable and deterministic flow. Now, those of you who are theorists might have noticed that I'm not doing the usual physicist trick of having a periodic boundary conditions, homogeneous isotropic three-dimensional turbulence. And the reason for that is that turbulence is fundamentally uh, about instabilities and symmetry is the enemy of instability. So we don't want to be thinking about turbulence as you just take a box and just put in some random force and just fluctuate it. We're actually thinking about a real flow that is generating the turbulence. And what's important is that that flow generates turbulence and that turbulence then can cause its own emergent mean flows and those can then react back on the imposed mean flow. And so you get a very complicated uh, feedback loop between what you're imposing and what then emerges from the, uh, from the behavior. Now, I talked at the beginning about how one would know if one had solved turbulence. So let's talk a for a few minutes about what one might mean by the idea of solving turbulence. So let's suppose um, that you go down the street and do you uh, find a physicist and uh, you ask her, what do you mean by solving turbulence? 
Well, what she might say is, well, turbulence is all about the velocity of a fluid fluctuating as you just showed us. So you should be able to predict something about those fluctuations at small scales. So what do we know about that? Well, the idea is this. If I look at the kinetic energy density of turbulence, the energy, kinetic energy per unit wave number range, K is the wave number, E is the kinetic energy. Um, so this is K, K over here on the horizontal axis. Large K means small distance, uh, small K means a large distance. And so this is the scale where you're putting uh, energy in, you're putting your fingers in the bathtub and swishing them around like this. And what happens is you generate um, eddies, whirly swirly motions of fluid that generate other eddies that get smaller and smaller and smaller. But the thing is that that is a Hamiltonian process. So as they spin off, uh, they generate uh, other eddies that um, doesn't involve friction at all. And eventually you get down to a very small scale where molecular viscosity becomes important and then something else takes, uh, takes over and you do get the usual dissipative processes. So the point is that in this cascade region, a very particular kind of physics is happening, which doesn't involve the viscosity. And what we're going to see is that this scale, this range of scales over which this occurs, depends upon how turbulent the fluid actually is. Now, the biggest advance in turbulence uh, after Richardson's idea from the 1920s of this cascade uh, was due to Komogov in the 1940s, K41, 1941. Uh, Komogov did the following calculation. He said, let's take this kinetic energy uh, per unit wave number range K and ask what it can be, depend upon. Well, it obviously depends upon the wave number K. It obviously depends upon how vigorously you're stirring your fingers in, in the bathtub, putting the energy into the fluid. So that's epsilon. It obviously depends upon the uh, kinematic viscosity nu, and it depends on how big the system is, L. So then out of these variables, you can make a length scale, which is called the Kolmogorov scale, which is nu cubed over epsilon to the one quarter power. And that tells you the scale at which molecular viscosity really turns out to be important. So I can rearrange uh, this formula so that it now depends only on two dimensions variables, the k times e to the k and k times l, and this prefactor here, which gives you the dimensions of energy per unit wave number range. Now, what Komogorov did next was say, well, let's make the fluid very turbulent. So we're going to keep the wave number fixed and let L go to infinity. And we're going to assume that that limit exists. So we're just going to cross out KL in this formula over here, replace it by infinity. So now we've got a problem that started off with four variables, was reduced to two, and now is reduced to just one. And now we're going to ask what happens as I take the fluid to be more and more uh, turbulent, which means that the uh, viscosity goes to zero, which means that the Kolmogorov scale goes to zero as well. So we'll take the limit as k eta goes to zero with k being a constant, and we're going to just replace this k eta by zero. But we can't do that quite like that, because the problem is that nu, the viscosity, occurs out here in the front, it occurs in eta out here in the front, and it occurs inside here. So the only way that I can get a result that is not zero if I do, or infinity if I do this calculation is if this function f has a power law form, so all the factors of eta cancel out. And when you do the calculation, uh, what you find is that it'll cancel out if this is a power law form, and then what you end up with is epsilon to the two thirds times k to the minus five thirds. It's a fantastic and beautiful uh, argument. And, uh, and it predicts then that in this range, the so-called inertial range, uh, the energy uh, spectrum, as, it, as it's called, uh, goes like k to the minus 5 thirds. It's a beautiful and wonderful argument. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite correct. In fact, this limit here, where we said we can just replace kL by infinity, turns out not to be right. In fact, uh, that limit doesn't exist. And so you just have to ask, what is the functional form of this function as this limit goes to infinity? And the answer is it goes like a, a power law with some exponent eta, not the same as this Kolmogorov scale, it's an exponent. And so what that means is that this uh, scaling of k to the minus five thirds gets modified by this, and that exponent is known as the intermittency exponent. And for those of you who maybe are from high energy physics, you might recognize, or from condensed matter physics for that matter, you might recognize this as being like an anomalous dimension in, uh, in, in field theory. Uh, 
which it is. And in fact, the first uh, anomalies in field theory uh, were discovered in fluid turbulence. Okay, so, so much for physics. Now you walk down the street a bit further and you run into an engineer and you ask the engineer and the engineer says, look, I don't care about what happens at small scales. I've got to design a car, I've got to design an airplane, I've got to design a gas pipeline. All I want to know is what is the friction experience at large scales and how can I make it smaller? So the engineer says, um, let's, let's measure it. So here's the measurements. These are data from Nicaragua in 1933. This is the friction that is experienced, normalized in a way that I'll talk about at the end of the talk. This is the Reynolds number. And they did this experiment uh, in a series of pipes which had rough walls. The smoother the pipe is, the smaller is the friction. So down here are data for the smooth pipes, up here are data for the roughest pipes. And the only thing I wanted to take away from this curve is it's a very complicated, you know, non-monotonic uh, function here that we need to understand. And you'll see later in the talk that we can actually understand uh, the details of this. So then you might say, well, that's, that's great, but let's, we can do better because surely there should be some connection between these things. Maybe we can connect the scales. So the question is, can I use what I've understood about the fluctuations at small scales to predict the drag experience at large scales? In other words, how does the drag experience at large scales reflect the very nature of the turbulent state at smaller scales? And we're gonna see that actually we can predict um, how that happens and we can make predictions on that, which we've confirmed. So then another person might say, well, look, all of that's well and good, but tell me, when is a fluid going to become turbulent as I increase the, vis the viscosity, uh, as, I, as I decrease the viscosity? And, and how does that happen? How do you understand uh, the laminar turbulent transition? And indeed, this was the topic of uh, Werner Heisenberg's PhD thesis. So the first experimental evidence uh, for this transition and how it works uh, was, uh, was done by Reynolds, Osborne Reynolds uh, in 1883. And he did the experiment where you inject fluid into a pipe and you put a little bit of ink in the fluid to act as a marker. And what you see is this, as you increase the speed, the, the flow starts off as being smooth and regular and laminar, like as shown here, for very high speed, the flow quickly becomes jagged, irregular, and turbulent. And in between, you get this transitional region where you get what he called flashes, and today we call those things puffs, interspersed with laminar regions, and then the puff, then laminar, then the puff, and so on. So you get this very non-uniform uh, structure here. And you might ask yourself the following question. Well, okay, as I increase the Reynolds number, how much turbulence is there in the pipe? And so here's my snapshots from Reynolds's paper. And here are experimental data, not, not for the, quite the pipe, but for a slightly different system, which I'll show you. And you can see that the, uh, the turbulent fraction uh, increases uh, as you would expect as you increase the Reynolds number. And just again, I want to emphasize that this transition is not spatially uniform. You have rare sharp bursts of turbulence and that's what makes it so complicated. So how do we try to understand this? Well we can get some insight by thinking critically about what I've just shown you so far. I've shown you that the turbulent fraction goes up like this, and you might say, oh, that reminds me of something. Uh, that reminds me of something that I've, that I've seen in, uh, in phase transitions. This looks like, say, the order parameter in a phase transition, or the, the way, say, the magnetization increases from zero as I go below the critical temperature in a magnet. The second thing I've shown you is the existence of this power law inertial range. And of course, this is the, the, uh, the energy spectrum, which is the velocity uh, fluctuation squared. So when we actually calculate this, what we're actually calculating is the velocity fluctuation or order correlation function. So you might say, well, then this is, is a correlation function, which is a power law. And of course, a power law correlation function is what you see at a second order phase transition or continuous phase transition. So there seems to be a connection between turbulence and phase transitions. So let's say something about that now. So this is really the answer to the question of why this problem has remained unsolved for so long. So let's ask this question by asking the analogous question of why are phase transitions hard? Why has that problem taken so long to solve? And it was solved in the, as, as I'll tell you, in the, in the 1970s and so, 60s and 70s um, uh, by the advent of the renormalization group. 
Now, phase transitions are hard because you have strong interactions and fluctuations in the order parameter, such as the magnetization. So here is the probability distribution of fluctuations. It's very non-Gaussian. If you look at them as a function of time, they are strongly fluctuating, they're very intermittent. But the real reason that they're hard is because there is no usable small parameter. Well, wait a minute, you say, how can there be no small parameter? We're looking in the vicinity of a phase transition occurring at a temperature Tc. So there must be a small parameter, which is T minus Tc over Tc, which is getting very, very small as I get close to the critical temperature. That's absolutely true. So here is the free energy that describes, say, a magnetic system close to that transition. But as you can read in page 191 of any good textbook on the normalization group, if you take this thing and apply dimensional analysis to it, what you will discover is in fact, there's only one parameter that describes the, uh, the fluctuations and their interactions. This is this parameter, which I've called u naught bar here. And it depends on this reduced temperature to the power d minus four over two, where you're supposed to think of d as being three for example. And so what that means is that as I get closer to the transition temperature, this interaction strength increases rather than decreasing. And so that's what becomes hard. And so there's no usable small parameter in the problem. Now, in turbulence, you also have strong interactions and fluctuations in the velocity derivatives and the gradients of the velocity field. They're very non-Gaussian and they're intermittent as sketched over here. And there's also no usable small parameter. So here's the Navier-Stokes equations I showed you earlier. Here is the quadratic nonlinearity that makes this whole problem hard to solve. That just comes from the inertia of the fluid. And as I set the viscosity going to zero or the Reynolds number going to infinity, this term goes to zero over here, uh, but this term has a coefficient of one and stays like that. So again, there's no small parameter, even though one over the Reynolds number is getting smaller and smaller. Now, the critical phenomena problem was solved uh, uh, by Ken Wilson, who developed the normalization group theory based on the ideas that Leo Kadanoff had come up with uh, uh, that explained uh, data collapse, uh, which I'm going to show you in a minute, that was discovered uh, by him independently and also uh, Ben, ben Whittle. And uh, what we're going to see is that the pathway to understanding critical phenomena also gives us some clues as to how to understand uh, turbulence. So we're going to see that in, in, in two ways. Uh, one is we can understand some of the features of turbulence uh, by following the, the, the method of discovery that, uh, was, that arose from these three people here. And, uh, and, the, and the other is we're going to look at the transition to turbulence and ask, is that actually a phase transition? And so that's what I want to turn to next. So today, uh, we study the transition to turbulence uh, following the seminal paper by uh, uh, Bjorn Hoff um, in, 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 in uh, 2008. So what Hoff did in this experiment was take a pipe, uh, inject fluid into it so that it is flowing. Uh, the, the flow is laminar. The flow is just smoothly going down. And then you it disturb the fluid by injecting a little bit of fluid in this hole here. And that little disturbance creates a localized region of turbulence, a puff. And then what you do is you just watch that puff as it drifts down the pipe. And of course, it's, you know how far it's got to go. And the question is, what happens when it comes out the other end? Now, if the puff dies away before it gets to the end, then the fluid will flow out faster than it otherwise would because turbulence causes increased drag. So what happens is that the, the, if the puff dies, the fluid will come out following the yellow trajectory here. On the other hand, if the puff is still exists by the time it gets to the end of the pipe, it'll come out somewhat slower and will follow the red trajectory. So now you say, okay, let's do this experiment a few hundred thousand times. And let's ask each time, does the pipe, does the fluid come out on the red trajectory or the yellow trajectory? Yes or no? Binary answer. And then you do many repetitions. And from that, you can work out the survival probability of turbulence as a function of the Reynolds number and as a function of the time since injection. And what you get when you do that is the following. So here is our puff shown here from a computer simulation. It's decaying in this Reynolds number range. So we call it a metastable puff. And if I look at the probability, the survival probability as a function of time on the horizontal axis for different Reynolds numbers, you can see that it follows the straight line curves here. And so follows an exponential time dependence with a lifetime that you can read off from this slope. 
And this lifetime is shown over here. This is the lifetime as a function of Reynolds number. It curves upward on this uh, semi-log plot. So that means that it's increasing with Reynolds number faster than an exponential function. When you go to higher Reynolds number, the, the turbulence now does want to persist. I mean, ultimately, as you go to a very high Reynolds number, you have fully, fully turbulent flow, of course. So, so now what happens is the way it gets there is that that puff that you create doesn't just stay there, it actually splits into two and creates a daughter puff. And so you can ask yourself the following question, how long does it take to split? Well, the higher the Reynolds number, the shorter the time it should take to split, because it will naturally want to be more eager to become turbulent. So you'd expect a curve that looks something like I'm sketching over here. And when you measure the data, uh, this is what you find, that the mean time between splitting events follows this curve here, which also then uh, um, decays faster than exponential. And if I take the double log of that on the, horizontal, on the vertical axis here, then these curves both become straight. And at this point here where they intersect, at long times, you have a finite probability of seeing turbulence stay, staying in the pipe because the puffs are splitting and so there'll always be some bit of turbulence left after you've created it. So that intersection defines the critical Reynolds number and, uh, and so we can see then that we have uh, we've understood how to measure the, uh, the critical Reynolds number. So what I've shown you so far is that all the time scales associated with turbulence in this transitional range actually scale super exponentially, i.e. as e to the e to the Reynolds number. Now this isn't just some you know, trick you do to make the data look smooth. It, there's actually a theoretical reason for that, which I will explain. So now to make a theory of this, what we're going to do is we're going to follow the same logic that we use to model real phase transitions, equilibrium phase transitions like those in the magnet. So I'm going to spend a few minutes reminding you of what that logic is, because it's counterintuitive and many people don't really, uh, don't really understand it very well. So let's think about a magnet. A magnet at its lowest level of description is described by its electronic structure. And if you try to start from that, say the Schrodinger equation, very, very hard to do. So then you say, well, look, magnetism comes from the interaction of the magnetic dipoles from the electrons. So let's have a look at the Ising model, a model of interacting a dipole spins, like electronic spins. Um, it can be a quantum mechanical or a classical model, uh, but that is too hard to solve as well. Uh, certainly in three dimensions, you can solve it in 2D if there's no external magnetic field and your name is Onsaga. Other than that, uh, we, we, we can't solve it exactly, but we can write down the approximate free energy for the system, which is what I showed you before, the Landau free energy. And then from that, we can use the renormalization group to make all sorts of predictions. So here is an example of how we do that. Here is the, how the magnetization varies as a function of temperature as you go below the transition temperature. This shape of this curve here is not a parabola as you might have first guessed. It goes as some non-integer power, which we'll call beta. This is where h is equal to zero, where h is the external field that you might apply to a magnet. Now, if you apply an external magnetic field to a magnet, that you're going to cause the spins to line up in the direction of the field. And you might expect that the more uh, field you apply, the more spins line up with the external field. And that's true, that's called Curie's law. But it breaks down at the critical temperature. So if you're sitting actually at TC, uh, the magnetization that you induce goes not the first power of H, but some non-integer power uh, that we write as one over delta. And what Widom and Kazanov discovered was that in fact, this function M that depends upon H and temperature it actually depends on a, on a, on a reduced a set of variables as shown over here, uh, which I call the similarity formula. So it says that if I plot the temperature in a particular, the magnetization in a particular way, all those data fall onto one universal curve. And here is the data from five different magnetic materials. And regardless of what the material is, they all fall onto this, these universal curves, one for T greater than TC, one for T less than TC. And the renormalization group prediction is the solid line that goes through the middle there. So this works very well. This model, this Heisenberg model, Ising model of a, of a magnet, uh, works extremely well and gives precise agreement with the experiment. However, this isn't really true. This is not a model at all. It's a model of a model of a model of a model of a model. It's a model that starts off with quantum chemistry, goes through all these, uh, these, uh, um, these developments here to eventually you get to Landau theory. 
And the point I want to bring home to you is that every step along the way here, you're making a non-systematic approximation that cannot be justified a priori. And later we understand that it can be justified from the point of view of, of relevant variables in the, in the renormalization group sense, which of course I'm not going to get into in this talk. So now when we talk about turbulence, we shouldn't expect to be able to do anything better than that. At the lowest level of description, we have particles bouncing around in the box, kinetic theory. We coarse grain to get the Navier-Stokes equation that describes the velocity of the coarse grain velocity in a, in, a, in a fluid region. But the question that we're going to ask is what is the analog of Landau theory for this non-equilibrium fluid system? And what is the analog of the renormalization group universality class? And now I'm going to show you that we can calculate these things uh, um, and, and, and identify them. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we use a numerical simulation to try to look for some insight. And the insight we get from phase transitions is that if this is a second order phase transition, it will occur through long wavelength collective modes. So let's go and look for some of those things. So that's what we did. And this is what we found when we did that. So here is a, a schematic of a pipe. We looked at a single uh, flow domain which just contained one puff. And we just looked at what's happening inside that puff as it's sort of undergoing its dynamics. And what we found was that at small scales, of course, there is turbulence, but at large, at large scales, at least in the, in the Z direction going along here, there's an azimuthal flow, which I've sketched over here, which you can see it's time dependent and radial structure shown over here. And the energy in that flow and the energy in the turbulence oscillate 90 degrees out of phase as shown over here. So that's an interesting finding, and it turns out we can understand where that comes from. If you work out the equation of motion for this azimuthal flow, let's call it V theta, it turns out that its dynamics depends on the what's called the Reynolds stress, the velocity fluctuations indicated by uh, tilde in the theta and the radial direction, and, and, and you look at the expectation value and look at the radial gradient. So what's happening is this. As you have to, uh, fluctuations that are anisotropic, this object here is non-zero, has an, a radial gradient, and that drives the azimuthal flow that you saw. But when you shear a fluid like this, why then you make it more isotropic? And by making it more isotropic, you are then suppressing this azimuthal flow. We call this azimuthal flow a zonal flow. So what's happening then is the turbulence over here is causing, is the, is the cause of the zonal flow. The zonal flow shears and so therefore suppresses the turbulence. And once the turbulence is suppressed, then the zonal flow is suppressed as well. But once the zonal flow has been suppressed, then the turbulence can then, uh, be, can then become an isotropic again. And so this cyclic behavior is similar to what happens uh, in an activator inhibitor system, such as the predator-prey system that you may know about from ecology. So in a predator-prey system, what happens is you have a food, let's say sheep, and, uh, and because they're there, the predator population goes up because they've got plenty of food to eat. But then uh, the predator is eating the prey, and so now the, eventually the, the predators will run out of sheep to eat, and so they'll start to starve. And once they start to starve, then the prey, the sheep, can then start to increase their population again. And so uh, you get this, uh, this cyclical uh, population behavior of the wolves and sheep, or in this case, the, uh, the uh, hare and lynx in this, uh, in this picture over here. So that's the idea then of, of a predator-prey oscillation. So then you say to yourself, well, how would we describe that? And the way that a physicist would describe a predator-prey dynamics is in the following way. You start off with the predators in red called A and the prey in B. The prey represent the turbulence. The predator represents this zonal flow, this azimuthal flow. And the way you describe this is you think of these particles just hopping around on a lattice, maybe diffusing, and they obey certain dynamics. For example, the prey can make babies as shown over here with this reaction. They can compete as shown in this reaction. And when a predator runs into a prey, with some probability P, it will eat it and then use the energy gained to make baby predators as shown over here. 
So now we can ask, all right, that's how you would describe a predator-prey ecosystem. So now we can say, can we make a Landau theory for the transition using this idea of stochastic predator-prey? And the way we're going to approach that is following some of the theoretical work that Bill Wild uh, developed in the early 1960s, applying Feynman diagrams to the Navier-Stokes equations. So essentially what's happening is this. I have a mean flow, this zonal flow, which is azimuthal. We have the small scale turbulence like this. And these are the only two modes that we care about. When they interact with each other, because the equation of motion is quadratic, then all the vertices here include three lines like this. And so what you're supposed to do in Landau theory is write down every allowed process. And so I've done that over here. And if you look at each of these processes, this one, for example, says turbulence encounters a zonal flow, uh, something happens, and out comes two zonal flows, two zonal flow lines. These diagrams have a precise interpretation in terms of integrals and things like this, which I'm not going to go into. Now, when you write that down, in this is a wave picture in particle language, this says A plus B goes to A plus A. This is just the predation interaction. And so, you, so now we have a way to uh, think about how to model uh, transitional turbulence. We just simply have to simulate those uh, predator-prey interactions. So now the question we're going to ask is, if we simulate that, what do we see? So first of all, let's have a look at the phase diagram. So this is the phase diagram for turbulence that I've already shown you. And here is the phase diagram for a predator-prey model. So what's happening here is that the analog of the Reynolds number is the prey birth rate. So think about this. Let's suppose I've got predator and prey in an ecosystem and the predators are the wolves, the prey are the sheep, the predator represents the zonal flow, the prey represents the turbulence. Let's suppose that the sheep uh, reproduce once every hundred years. So what happens is the wolves come along and they eat up all the sheep and then the ecosystem just dies because there's no food left to eat. On the other hand, let's suppose that the prey, the sheep, can reproduce every five minutes. Well, then what's going to happen is the wolves are going around eating the sheep. Uh, the sheep are busy making babies. And so you can get a coexistence of the two things together. And so there's a transition as you increase the prey birth rate where you can get an ecosystem which is both predator and prey in it coexisting. And that's the transition to turbulence. So uh, what we do is we, we, we uh, create a pipe, a 2D pipe, we put in it a population and we see what happens. In this regime here, uh, you start off with a, with a puff of the predator-prey population and it eventually dies away. Here in this regime, uh, what happens is that there's a pattern formation process, uh, that puff splits into two populations uh, that have traveling waves, just like you see over here. If we write out, in that spatiotemporal intermittency regime, the space-time picture, you get something like this. Here is time on the vertical axis and space on the horizontal axis, and the color scale tells you about the intensity of turbulence. You can see that here is a puff, travels backwards in this frame of reference, and then uh, splits into two, and then that puff splits into two, and so on. Here, you have the population splitting in a predator-prey ecosystem. Uh, this is time, this is space, the color scale tells you the population of the prey. And you can see what's happened is I have a, a, a localized region that then undergoes a pattern forming instability and splits into two successively, as you can see over here. So we get this branching structure that looks just uh, like what we see uh, in real fluid terms. So now we can measure the statistics of the extinction time and the time between these population splitting events in the, in the spatial temporal intermittency regime. And when you do that, this is what you get. Here is the data that I already showed you from uh, turbulence and pipes. Here are the data from the computer simulation of the predator-prey system. And you can see it recapitulates exactly what you see here. And so what we've learned then is that the extinction transition in ecology is equal to the death of turbulence. All right, so what I've shown you so far is we started off with turbulence over here. We looked at what happened very close to the transition to turbulence. We saw that the flow could be reduced to a two fluid model. That two fluid model behaved like a predator prey ecosystem. The question we really want to understand is if this is a transition, what is its universality class? And the answer turns out to be that it's directed percolation. I'm going to show you that now. What we're going to see is that we can solve this question of what is the universality class. We can make precise agreements 
that, that this transition has critical exponents associated with this, and we can measure those, and we can see that it actually works. And the way we're going to do that, technically the way you would do it, is you would write down a, a statistical field theory that represents the stochastic predator prey system, and then do various renormalization group uh, manipulations on that, and you would end up with a prediction of directed population. I'm not going to do that, of course. I'm going to show you it graphically, and I'm going to do that right now. So what is directed percolation anyway? Well, directed percolation is what happens when you make a coffee in the morning. So imagine that I take my funnel, I pour in some coffee grounds, and I pour water on top of that. So what happens is this. Uh, the coffee grounds are loosely packed, the water flows through them, and it has some probability of being able to find some space between the grains. Let's call that probability P. If it's easy to get through the space between the grains, the water quickly flows through the coffee granules, uh, ends up at the bottom, and the cup of coffee that you make is absolutely disgusting. It's what you get served in a supermarket or a 7-Eleven or a, you know, a petrol station here in, the, in America, um, and you wouldn't want to drink that. So then you say, fine, that's terrible. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put the coffee grains in. I'm going to pack them down really tight into my filter. And uh, then you dribble the water on it. But what happens is the probability of being able to get through is now too small. And so what happens is the water backs up, flows all over the counter, makes a huge mess. Everybody yells at you. And again, you don't even end up with a cup of coffee. So, but there should be some packing fraction, some probability P of being able to get through the, uh, the coffee granules such that you can just about get to the other side. And then you get, uh, as long as you can make the coffee take as long as possible to flow, uh, the water to take as long as possible to flow through the coffee granules, you get a nice strong cup of coffee. And, uh, and that's what you want to achieve. Now, if you look at the trajectories that I've sketched here, you can convince yourself that all of those trajectories can be represented by one of these, composed from one of these four different motifs. In these motifs, this is the time at the top, this is the next time step on the bottom, and you start off with a filled site, and then it doesn't manage to get through to the other side. That's annihilation. On the other hand, you start off with this site, and now you get through to two of these sites below, that's called decoagulation. Or you can go from this site to the one diagonal, that's called diffusion, or you can have two filled sites at the, at the top, and the next time step you only left with one, that's called coagulation. Those four basic processes are the four basic processes of directed percolation. So this is a graphical picture, this is space along here, time along here, and a filled site is, is where it is percolated through. Those filled sites in fact represent turbulence in our analogy here. Now, when uh, the probability is very small of getting through, that's when the coffee doesn't get through the filter, it backs up over the counter and everybody yells. This over here is when it's very easy to get through to the other side, and at very long times, you'll see many of these sites are occupied, so there's a high amount of occupation or a high turbulent fraction in the system. And this over here is the perfect cup of coffee. At the critical percolation value, you just about managed to get through at long times to the other side, uh, it takes the longest possible time, the best cup of coffee, and the amount of turbulence you have at long times, the turbulent fraction, scales like the percolation uh, P minus PC to some exponent beta. Okay, so that's directed percolation thought of as, a, as, a, as in this coffee uh, experiment. Now, in actual turbulence, what's happening is I've got a 3D pipe here uh, that you started off with a puff, that puff then decays away, as you can see in this uh, simulation on the left. If I look at a snapshot through this simulation, I start off my filled sites here. And then as I look down, what I see is the very last pixel that appears is the one that comes up uh, from here. And so uh, what you've learned from this is that the turbulence lifetime is determined by the longest of these percolating paths here. Now, if I ask myself the following question, if I have a bunch of independent paths and I ask, what is the probability distribution that governs the length of the largest of those paths? The answer is not given by the central limit theorem. It's given by extreme value statistics. If I asked, what is the average length of these paths here, assuming that they're independent random percolating paths, the answer, of course, would be a Gaussian probability distribution, the central limit theorem. But if I ask for a random variable, which is the maximum of these paths, and I do this experiment again and again and again, then I have to ask what is the probability distribution for the maximum of a bunch of random variables. 
And the answer to that is given by the fischer tippett gumbel distribution shown over here, which has the functional form, well, this is cumulative distribution, has the functional form e to the minus e to the minus one. And this is fundamentally the reason uh, why you get the super exponential behavior that I showed you at the beginning. It's more complicated than what I've said, but that's fundamentally what's going on. Now, if we look near the transition and we look at the predator prey processes, but now written down with a space label I or J as shown over here, near the transition, there's very few prey. And so there's even smaller number of predators. So we'll just cross out those reactions. And now we've gone from a three trophic level ecosystem to a two trophic level ecosystem, where there's just the uh, prey and the energy source or in this case, turbulence and the energy, which is the kinetic energy of the laminar flow. If I look at each of these reactions shown here and write it down graphically, you can see that each of these reactions here is the basic reaction for directed percolation. And so what I've shown you then is that near the extinction transition, stochastic predator-prey dynamics reduces to directed percolation. So is it true? We've predicted then that the transition to turbulence should be in the directed percolation universality class. So Bjornhoff did this beautiful experiment, uh, again, in the same paper where our paper, uh, same journal where our paper appeared back to back. Um, here he took a Taylor Coet system, which is uh, uh, two coaxial cylinders, very close together. The inner one is stationary, the outer one is uh, rotating. You look along a slit, uh, into the fluid and uh, you shine laser light on it and you can take pictures of what's happening. As the fluid goes past the slit, what you see is the, a picture like this, something white here, something black here, black, white, black, and so on. These white regions are laminar flow. These black regions are turbulence. And so if I take these pictures, the first rotation looks like this, the second rotation looks like this, the third rotation looks like this and so on. They look pretty much the same, but if I stack them up one underneath each other, you can start to see small differences as these turbulent regions move around. And if you do that, what you get as, as you vary the rotation speed of the outer cylinder are these pictures here for Reynolds number greater than the critical Reynolds number, equal to the critical number, or roughly equal to it, and less than. These pictures look to the eye like the pictures I showed you of directed percolation. And if you measure the turbulent fraction in the pipe, what, uh, you see that it scales over two decades of reduced uh, uh, Reynolds number uh, with the critical exponent known for directed percolation in one space and one time direction. And there's many other measurements that you can do that measure all the other critical exponents of the directed percolation transition. And just in the last uh, uh, month or two, uh, they published a paper in Physio of Letters extending this now to two dimensions. Similarly, uh, you can do a, a numerical experiment uh, of a, of a, in 2D of a plane of shear flow. This was done uh, by these people over here. And uh, the end result again is just simulating the Navier-Stokes equations. Nothing to do with phase transitions, no temperature, no predator prey, nothing. Just simulating Navier-Stokes, uh, you measure uh, the critical exponents and critical behavior uh, associated to directed percolation. How about the predator prey interactions? Well, those are very weak near the transition. They have to be, so it's very hard to observe them. Uh, but uh, in uh, in uh, in plasma physics, you can observe them. So here is the um, is is a tokamak. Uh, and there's drift wave turbulence going along the uh, axis here, zonal flow going around the outside. And uh, 10 years or so ago, uh, Strada et al. were able to actually measure these predator prey uh, oscillations. And uh, these have been predicted by my UCSD colleague, uh, Pat Diamond, uh, many years ago. Okay, so what I've shown you then is that we've predicted that the diamond turbulence tr transition is a non-equilibrium critical point in the universality class of directed percolation, and this prediction has been a confirmed experiment. But I want to get to the second question, which is about fluctuations and, and dissipation. So remember at the beginning, I told you about Nicaragua's experiment with pipes with rough walls. So what he actually did was he uh, glued sand grains of a uniform size to the walls of the pipe and he varied the diameter of the pipe. And so he was able to measure, uh, he was able to uh, vary the relative roughness of the pipes. What he measured was the pressure drop across the pipe, along the pipe, um, normalized by the kinetic energy density rho times u squared. 
Now look at this u squared here. That's the normalization is going to be important for what I tell you next. But this measure of the pressure drop then is what's known as the friction factor. If the pressure drop is big, it means there's a high friction. So here are the curves I showed you uh, earlier. Uh, the curves at the bottom are for smooth pipes. The curves at the top are for uh, rough pipes. Now, this regime over here is the laminar regime. Because in the laminar regime, the friction is proportional to how fast the fluid is flowing. But we're dividing by u squared, the velocity squared. So then the friction factor should go like one over the velocity, or in other words, one over the Reynolds number. And that's what happens over here. Then there's a transition to turbulence, which is what I just showed you in, in the last uh, 30 minutes or so. And then you can see that as I go further up in Reynolds number, what is happening is the friction uh, the, uh, is following this uh, line here. And the smoother the pipe is, the further along the line it goes. And this line has a slope of Reynolds to the minus one quarter, and we'll call that the Blasius regime. Then something happens here, something non-monotonic. And then finally, at large Reynolds numbers, what happens is the friction becomes independent of the Reynolds number. It's flat like this, but it just depends on the roughness of the pipe. And it depends on the roughness divided by the diameter raised to the power one third. And that's called the Strickler law. So we want to understand where those things uh, come from. And the question we're going to ask is, is this evidence of a critical phenomenon? Now, I'm going to do the same analysis that Widom and Kadanov did for the phase transition problem in, in magnets. And let's talk very quickly about how you do that. So I've really shown you that in turbulence, the energy spectrum correlations go as k to the minus 5 thirds, which is like the order parameter correlations going at least in mean field theory as k to the minus 2. Okay, so that's an analogy. I showed you data collapse. Here is the curve that I showed you, the data collapse in a, in, a, in a critical point. And so the question that we are going to ask ourselves is what is the analog of that data collapse for turbulence? Okay, well, it's a long story, and I'm not going to go into how, how I did this, this calculation, but the end result is, and you can see these papers here, is that you end up with this formula. It depends on the Reynolds number to this exponent times the roughness times the Reynolds number to this exponent here, where this eta is the intermittency correction that I showed you at the beginning in, in, Kolmogor, in discussing Kolmogorov's theory for the uh, inertial range. And you can see that these data here collapse onto these, this universal curve here. And the estimate of the intermittency correction that you produce is consistent with independent measurements of that. And so what I've shown you then is that there is a critical point at infinite Reynolds number and zero roughness, which controls the scaling behavior and the phenomenology uh, above the critical point, which leads to the, uh, the turbulence in the first place. So this is the, again, filling out then what this diagram looks like. This is the Widom scaling law for phase transitions. This is the law that you get uh, for turbulence. So this is really fantastic because think about what, we've just, what I've just told you. I've told you that in 1933, Nicaragua just took a pipe, sent a turbulent fluid through it and just measured the pressure drop. By doing that, he had inadvertently measured the anomalous spectral exponents, the anomalous uh, scaling exponents, the anomalous dimensions associated to the field theory of fluid turbulence. And he had done that eight years before Kolmogorov was even to guess the mean field theory, the K to K41, K to the minus five thirds scaling law. So that's fantastic for one thing. I was very lucky to be the first physicist who knew about critical point phenomena to look at the Nicaragua data and realize, well, we, we can do something interesting here. The second thing is that what we've learned is that the friction factor then gives us the intermittency corrections to the velocity fluctuations. So therefore there's a connection between the velocity fluctuations at small scales and the friction factor of dissipation at large scales. And that's something that I've called, and we've called it in, in our papers, the spectral link, and is an example of a fluctuation dissipation relation. Now, where is the origin of these power laws, one quarter and one third? So my colleagues at Illinois, Gustavo Joya and Palaki Chakraborty, in, in, in their paper back to back with my paper, they worked that out too, in, at least in some sort of heuristic mean field kind of way. I'm not going to go through it, but the bottom line is they came up with this formula. 
and the friction, the dissipation, depends on the energy spectrum uh, integrated in this way and, and square root and so on. So this is a, a fluctuation dissipation relation. So, and if you, if you plug into that formula that the energy spectrum is the Kolmogorov spectrum, then you get out of it the Strickler and Blasius law. Okay, so can we test that? Is this just, is this just number, number fitting, curve fitting? So in two dimensions, it turns out that there are two cascades, not one. In, 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 tur in, in turbulence in 2D, you can have an energy cascade, just like you can in 3D, but in that case, it goes from small to large scales rather than from large to small scales. Okay, so we know, we know this. Uh, the other thing we know is that there is a forward cascade, not of energy, but of a variable, something like angular momentum. It's called entropy. It's basically the vorticity squared. And this entropy cascade has a different energy spectrum because angular momentum is a different dimension than energy itself. And so when you work it out, it goes as k to the minus three up to logarithms. And that leads to a prediction using, using the, uh, the, this uh, formula here that the friction factor in the Blasius regime should go as Reynolds to the one half, and it should go as roughness to the one power in comparison to what you have for an energy cascade. So let's see if it's true. So we did the experiment. Uh, this is a two-dimensional turbulent soap film, soap film between two uh, nylon strings like this. Um, on the boundaries here, which you can see in this photograph, are kind of saw blades. Uh, you put particles in the flow and you scatter laser light of them so you can do what's called laser Doppler velocimetry. You can then create turbulence by putting a, a grid in the flow like this. So that here is a grid. The soap film uh, flows, goes through the grid, becomes turbulent, and you can measure the energy spectrum. And there's this k to the minus three law that I told you about a few minutes ago. If you do it in this geometry, where you just have one side with a saw blade, a structure like this, then you get um, a k to the minus five thirds, uh, which is what you would get for an inverse energy cascade. So now we have to ask, what is the friction factor? And you can measure it. We did these experiments twice in Bordeaux and in Pittsburgh. And here you can see for the energy cascade, you get the predicted law of Reynolds to the minus a quarter. But for the entropy cascade, you get Reynolds to the minus a half, just as we have predicted. Similarly, if you go beyond the Blasius regime in 2D, these are uh, experiments reported last year by my collaborators Hamid Kalei and Pinaki Chakraborty, uh, they observed the Strickler regime where the friction factor just depends on the roughness to the one power, just as we predicted. And they also measured the universal scaling function. You couldn't get all of it, this transition region here, but they got enough of it that we can be sure that it matches the predictions uh, that we've made in our 2009 paper. So what I show you then is that we can understand the uh, fluctuations and, and, and dissipation exactly the way that uh, we would, we would uh, predict from statistical mechanics. And both of these predictions have been confirmed experimentally. So now I'll end. So our take home message is that there's two types of universality in turbulence. There's the critical point of the lamb in a turbulence transition. There's a critical point that controls fully developed turbulence and they each have their own different characteristics. This is my graphical abstract, which I, I don't need to repeat. Here are the people who did the work uh, with me, uh, Hamid Calais in Bordeaux, the late Walter Goldberg in Pittsburgh, Tuan Tran, who was an Illinois student who spent a few years uh, working in Walter Goldberg's lab, and we had lab meetings over Skype for several years uh, every week. Uh, many, many hours we spent uh, visiting and working uh, to do these experiments. Gustavo Joy and Panaki Chakraborty in, uh, in uh, their lab in, in OIST. Uh, this is also from in the background. And this is our Hong Yen Shi and me in the basement of the mechanical engineering department at the University of Manchester, where you can see Reynolds's original experimental apparatus. This is Tsong Lin, who was a, an undergraduate who worked with us on the numerical simulations. I want to end with a fortune cookie. This is a real fortune cookie that I got. And it says, turbulence is a life force. It is opportunity. Let's love turbulence and use it for change. And in fact, for luck, for luck, it gives you some numbers that you can use for your Monte Carlo simulations. Now, I'm the single best person in the world to get this fortune cookie. And I really did get it. And the reason is that it connects turbulence with life, in other words, biology. 
Now, usually what happens in biophysics is that we use physics to solve a problem in biology, make a better microscope, do a better computer simulation, see something that you've never seen before inside a cell or something like this. But in the story I told you today, we actually used some insights that we got from ecology, from biology, to elucidate something about fluid turbulence. And it, well, that doesn't happen very often, and it, but it happened here. So I'm finished uh, with that. I'll leave you with some references and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.